Well, on October the 31st, 1517, the German reformer Martin Luther pinned his 95 thesis on the door of Wittenberg Cathedral. The document was outlining uh, the various uh, theological errors of the Roman Catholic Church, or what would become the Roman Catholic Church, and it was his attempt to correct this theology. Within his opening statement, the first point of the whole document, he says the following, Our Lord and Master Jesus Christ, in saying, Repent ye, intended that the whole life of his believers on earth should be a constant penance. In other words, he was saying that repentance is not simply a one-time event in the life of the Christian. Yes, that is how we first become a Christian. If you're not yet a Christian, uh, then the first thing you must do to become one is to turn from your sins and call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, asking him for the forgiveness of your sins and to be Lord over you uh, for, from this time forward. No, Luther said, it is not a, repentance is not a one-time event in the life of a Christian. It doesn't stop the moment we become believers. Rather, the Christian believer who began with repentance must also go on in repentance towards God. But how do we define what repentance is? Well, repentance is not merely an intellectual exercise where a person changes their mind about God. Repentance is a change of mind, but it is not merely intellectual. It is not merely going from someone who says, I am, I am unconvinced of the logical arguments about the existence of God, and I now uh, believe that there must be a deity who created the world and by his power sustains it. Nor is repentance merely an emotional response to being found out that we have committed sin. Uh, or it, we can have as many tears as we uh, like, but repentance is not merely an emotional response. Now, just to, just to bring some nuance to this, repentance is both intellectual and emotional, but it is not merely only either of those. Repentance is a change of mind that produces a profound and lasting change of behaviour. And it consists of three things. It consists of conviction of sin, that as we read God's law, as we see his holy and perfect standard, we realise, uh, as the Holy Spirit works in our lives, that we have fallen short, we have failed and we are sorry for our sin. But it consists also not only of conviction of sin, but of faith towards God. It is not merely turning away from bad behaviour. That's simply moralism. Repentance, biblical repentance, the repentance that Jesus calls us towards, is to turn from sin to the Saviour, to put faith in God to forgive us, to put faith in God, to give us the grace to change. And thirdly, repentance is a resolution to obey the Lord Jesus Christ. It consists of a resolution to obey the Lord Jesus Christ. He said to his disciples, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So I wonder, have you repented of your sin? Because in Luke 13, verses 1 to 17, we see the Lord Jesus calling his hearers to this precise thing. He says to them that they need to repent or they will perish. And in this message, what I want us to do tonight is to see three reasons from Luke 13, 1 to 17, why we should repent and go on repenting in our lives. So, three reasons. Firstly, I want you to see that we should repent because death is inevitable. 
death is inevitable. In verse 1, we find that the crowds are still following the Lord Jesus as he is making his way towards the city of Jerusalem, where he will be betrayed into the hands of the uh, Gentile authorities and where he will be uh, executed through crucifixion. But as the crowd are following him, not everyone is his friend. There are some in the crowd who are seeking to draw him on a contemporary issue. They tell him about a Galilean atrocity which likely happened during the previous Passover because it was at the time of Passover where uh, the ordinary Israelite uh, believers would be allowed to participate in, uh, in, in the sacrificial system in the temple. And it appears that at that time, some worshippers who had come from the north uh, of Israel in Galilee, and while they were there making sacrifices, Pilate, the governor of uh, the area, the Roman governor, had for some reason seen this as an act of sedition against him and had his soldiers come in and murder these Galilean worshippers. As a result, the blood of the victims had become mingled with the blood of the sacrifices and so polluting the offerings that were to be provided before God. But why, why are the people raising this? Well, they, you see, they're trying to draw Jesus into uh, getting himself into trouble. In the first place, they have a prejudice against the northern area of of Israel in Galilee. You remember how uh, someone said, uh, can anything good come, from, come out of Galilee? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Uh, the, this, they, had a, they had this, uh, there, was, there was geographical and social tensions between the north and the south of Israel. And they were trying to draw Jesus into this. Come on, Jesus, tell us what we're all thinking, that the Galileans are worse sinners than the, those who are in Jerusalem, than those who are in the south of the country. And secondly, they're trying to draw him to speak against Pilate, because after all, they really don't like that they are an occupied nation. Uh, this was something that the, the Israelite people would have seen as a, a bad situation because they were the chosen people of God who had been given the land as their inheritance and they had been a people who had been granted a king who would reign over them and now, though they have returned from Babylonian exile, they still do not have autonomy of their, and sovereignty of their own nation. But they have these Gentile, godless, idol-worshipping pagans ruling over them. So come on, Jesus, you're the Messiah. Speak against the political leaders and system of the day. But Jesus refuses to be drawn. And instead, he turns it around on them. Verse 2 and 3. Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? You see, their, their point of view is, if something happens to you that is terrible, something like a calamity, something like soldiers suddenly bursting in upon you and slaughtering you, it must be because there is some hidden sin that no one else thought about that you have not repented of and therefore this is judgment of God upon you. And before we look down our noses at these people, we can sometimes have the, the, the same view, the same faulty theology uh, ourselves when some things ba something bad has happened to us and we immediately start thinking, well, what sin have I committed? Now, it is true, God disciplines those he loves, but not everything that causes you suffering is necessarily because God is displeased with you or is a result of sin. Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. You see, Jesus answered there, 
reveals the snobbery, the spiritual snobbery of the Judeans, of those who are questioning him. There were sinners than us. Nothing like that has happened to us. And so he goes on to talk about a Judean accident that happened near the pool of Siloam. It's, it's likely that, and we, we don't know all the details, but it's likely that uh, the, the towers along the city wall were being renovated, uh, perhaps being repaired. And while this is going on, a, one, of the wall, one of the towers has collapsed, killing 18 people. Were they from Galilee? No. Where were they from? Jerusalem. But again, the Lord is clear, this didn't happen because they had committed some offence against God. Look what he says, verse 4 and 5, All those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying something very simple. We are all guilty of sin. We are all guilty of sin. Whether you think you're a big sinner or a little sinner, all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. We have broken his standard. We have offended him. And unless we repent, a greater calamity than soldiers bursting in and slaughtering you during your worship time or a tower falling on you while you're by the pool is is going to take place and what is that greater calamity it is that the wrath of God in judgment fall upon us Jesus would call it hell do you realize that every one of us unless the Lord returns first, will one day die, and after this we'll have to face the judgment. That there will be a day, inevitably, where we have to stand before Almighty God and give an account of our own lives. And while we remain unrepentant, we are in danger of the righteous anger of God falling upon us, something far worse than soldiers slaughtering us or a tower collapsing on us. Because hellfire does not happen swiftly, but endures for eternity. Therefore repent, because death is inevitable. Secondly, I want you to see that we should repent because God is merciful. Jesus is the master teacher. And as the master teacher, he reinforces his point concerning our need of repentance with a story, a parable. It's a parable about a man who has a vineyard, who plants a fig tree, and has a gardener, a vine dresser, overseeing it. Let's think about each of these in turn. The, the, the owner of the vineyard, who planted a fig tree, he represents God the Father in the parable. And Jesus says, for three years, the owner has visited the vineyard to check the fig tree to see if it has produced any fruit. And every year, upon his visitation, he, he finds, to his disappointment, that the tree has failed to bear any fruit and has remained totally bare. Now think about this just for a second, because this fig tree being planted in a vineyard. That's not the normal place for a fig tree to be planted. And his concern here is that the fig tree, while it is bearing no fruit, is remaining useless to him and taking up ground and space and nourishment for the, to, for the vines to grow properly and healthily. But then we see a fig tree. So, so the owner represents God the Father, but in the parable the fig tree represents the covenant people of God of the, in the Old Testament, who were Israel. And we know this because Jesus' imagery here is not unique to himself. He is actually borrowing pictures 
from the Old Testament prophets like Jeremiah, uh, Hosea, and Micah. That here, 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 Israel in those places, in, in, in those pro- by those prophets, the, the people of Israel are spoken of as being like a fig tree. And Jesus now takes that imagery and he applies it to his own parable. Is it going to be fruitful for God or is it going to be barren? And as the owner comes and finds for the third year running that his tree is still not producing any fruit, he says to the vine dresser, it should be dug up and it should be destroyed. Such is the severity of God. Do you see how this is tying in with everything that has just happened and the conversation that's just happened? That here are these people who Jesus has told, repent or you will likewise perish. And now he's telling a story using familiar sim- symbols about the, uh, the, the people of God and the need to be fruitful people before God. That if they are not fruitful, if they are not bearing the fruit of repentance, which is a godly life, righteous living, holiness to the Lord, then the Father will simply say, dig it up and destroy it. So who's the vine dresser? Well, the vine dresser represents, in this parable, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the vine dresser argues from the point of mercy. You see, as the owner tells him to dig it up and throw it away, he pleads with the owner to give the tree just one more year. One more year to see if it will become fruitful. And in the meantime, he will seek to nurture it by tending to its roots, digging around it, putting manure on top of it, in the hope that when the owner returns to survey it once more, it will have been productive. But, he says in verse 9, if not, you can cut it down. Now, we mustn't push this illustration too far, otherwise we will think that there is some disunity in the Godhead, that there is disagreement between the Father and the Son, that's not the case. The Father and the Son, through all eternity, have been in, uh, in, in, in union and in harmony with one another. So don't push the par- parable too far. So what is happening? Well, the Father here, the owner here, is speaking from the point of righteousness. He is saying that it is only right that if this tree which I have invested in, that I have had planted in my vineyard, if it does not produce the fruit I have been expecting it to produce, then it is useless to me and it deserves to be cut down. And so, as the, as the Father speaks about, uh, about those who would claim to be his people, he, he is... I, I, He is just to say, are my people bearing the fruits of godliness? Are they bearing the fruits of repentance? If not, it only shows we do not truly belong to him and he is is righteous to bring judgment upon us. His judgment is severe, but it is never unjust. It is never unfair. It is never disproportionate. It is always righteous. But the Son, as the Father speaks from the point of righteousness, the Son in the parable is speaking here from the point of mercy and patience as the mediator between God and his people. This is similar to what we saw in the children's talk this morning when while Moses was up on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments from God, the people down below were worshipping a false god, the golden calf. And God, seeing this, suddenly became furious and said he would destroy his people. But Moses 
pleads with him on their behalf as their mediator and advocate, saying, think of your righteousness, think of your own name, think of the promises you have made, and please do not do this. God would not have been wrong to do it. They, they had broken his commandments before they had even got down off the mountain. But, they, but, but, the, but God shows mercy and patience by withholding his judgment on the people because of Moses' intercession. And here is the role of the Son of God, our great high priest. He is the one who intercedes on behalf of his people. Here is the one who, who speaks mercy and patience. And the, but but don't, don't think the two are in conflict. You know, bec- I think we, we sometimes, because we see things black and white, we, we see righteousness and mercy or judgment and grace as two opposing forces, as a problem. But that's because we are not God. There is no problem. In fact, the two voices speaking here are actually in harmony with one another because they are spoken with the same will that God's people should be spiritually right with him. But the point is this. We must never, ever think that we have no need of repentance because no calamity or because the judgment of God has not yet fallen upon us. I remember to this day standing in Birmingham near the bull ring and a man saying to me on the street that he did not believe in God and if God was real, then he should strike him down dead right now. And then he smiled and said, see, he hasn't done it. And I simply responded by saying, no, that's because God is more patient than you are. Um, I won't tell you the rest. Um, Here is a a patient God. A patient God. The reason judgment hasn't fallen upon the unrepentant at this time is because God is merciful and patient towards us. The reason this world has not been wrapped up and thrown away is because of God's patience, not because of our deservedness. But while we remain unrepentant, do you see what you are doing? You are putting God to the test. You are using his patience as an excuse for sin and you are provoking him to anger and storing up for yourself judgment on the day of his wrath. We must repent because God is merciful. Don't use God's mercy as a reason to stand away from him but, and, and as a reason conti- to continue sinning, but y- use his, uh, take the opportunity, seeing that he is a merciful, a gracious and a patient God, to come near to him while today is the day of salvation. But then finally, I want you to see that we must repent because Satan is powerful. Satan is powerful. Now, as Luke moves on in his narrative, we follow Jesus into a synagogue. Now, while I was reading this, you may have been wondering, why has Steve chosen to not stop at verse 9? Why continue to verse 17? The two events seem unrelated, but actually they're not unrelated. There's two clues in particular that I want you to see that show us that these two events are actually connected. Firstly, this is the last time that Jesus will visit a synagogue in Luke's Gospel. This is the last time Jesus will visit a synagogue before, go- as, before going into Jerusalem. We don't read of him entering another synagogue. So this is their opportunity. They have the Son of God in front of them. They have the Saviour of the world speaking to them. Will they receive him or will they reject him? Will they repent or will they perish? Secondly, it's important to notice numbers in the Bible. 
and, and, and particularly, sometimes you, we can get caught up in them and, and get lots of nonsense from them, but there are times when numbers are used very deliberately to point us to something. There's a number that's used, and it's the number 18. Did you notice that the, how many people were killed by the tower falling on them? 18. How many uh, years had this woman had a disabling spirit for? 18. Luke is drawing us, drawing our attention to these details so that we would see that he is connecting both of these events to make this very important point about repentance. So let's see here what this is all about. And I want you to, real, to notice that here what Jesus does is he gives us a foretaste of the victory he will win over the kingdom of Satan as he enters J Jerusalem and lays down his life on the cross. So while he's there in the synagogue, he notices this woman who has a curvature of the spine. And it, what we need to understand about synagogue is that just like the temple, uh, there was a seating plan. You should be very happy we don't have a seating plan uh, at church um, because the women would be sat towards the back and then the men would be sat in front and the elders, the rabbis, would be sat uh, all uh, on the front facing the people. Uh, Je Jeff and Graham are particularly thankful that we don't uh, do this. But... And so it would have been easy for you to not notice this woman. And yet Jesus, while he's in the synagogue, notices what no one else notices. Here is this woman with a disabling spirit. And in front of everyone, she calls her from the back to come forward before the whole congregation to stand before him. And this isn't to embarrass her, this is simply to... To, to make a point to the whole gathering, so that the whole gathering would witness what he's about to do. And when she comes near, and you can picture this in your mind, here is this woman, bent over, unable to stand up straight. She's been like this for 18 years, and she is, she, we, can, we can think of her struggling to walk her way to the front, to, to, to the Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And as she comes to him, uh, as she draws near to him, he says to her, woman, uh, not, a, not a rude, uh, a rude uh, uh, greeting at all, uh, but in, in that culture, a, a particularly polite and respectful greeting. Woman, he says, you are free. You are free from, from this bondage. You are free from your, dis, from your disability. And he lays his hands on her, and you can picture this, uh, as he takes her and he, he straightens her up. And as, as he does so, there's no pain, there's no resistance, immediately she is healed immediately she can stand up straight and what does she do well she does what what all godly, godly women do she praises god and she glorifies him for what has happened to her it's a it's a time to celebrate isn't it it's a time to rejoice in god it's a time to 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 praise him not if you're a sanctimonious ruler it's not because here comes a sanctimonious ruler of the synagogue who quite rudely ignores Jesus and faces the congregation and gives them a stern rebuke. What does he say? He says uh, in verses, verse, verse 14, there are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days, and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Just hover over that thought for a moment, that comment, that rebuke. Is his theology correct? His theology is fairly right. God gave us six days to work. But 
but then there's something, else, there's something not quite right about this, isn't there? His theology, he would, he would get a good mark for his theology of creation in, in seminary. Yeah, God gave us six days to work. And then he, sa- and then he says, come on one of those days and be healed. Now, now, just think about this. This is a woman who has had this curvature of the spine for how many years? 18 years. Presumably, she is known in the synagogue. Presumably, she is regularly attending the synagogue. After all, Jesus does say she's not a Gentile. She, she's not a, a sort of a fair-weather uh, Jew. She is a daughter of Abraham. She loves God. She's diligent in her worship. She, she is there, we can presume, quite safely. She is there week in, week out. Perhaps she's like some of the women in the Old Testament who often went to, uh, to, to temple, not just on the Sabbath day. And in all of that time, no one has ever healed her. Has anyone ever had the ability to heal her? And here is the Son of God, the healer, who has been moving around the northern part of Israel, healing the sick. And here is the Son of God, present among the people of God in the synagogue. And and, And he says, come back another day? Missing the opportunity. Missing the opportunity. But it's more than that. It's more serious than that. Because he has a fundamental misunderstanding of the Sabbath. You see, the Sabbath was a day of rest. It's a day of release. It's a day of good. And instead, through the various rules and regulations that the Pharisees had cooked up, in their own man-made traditions that God never spoke about. They have tied people up in a bondage worse than her spinal curvature. They have wrapped her up, binding her, so that she can never find relief, so that she can never find rest. The Sabbath is, is a day that points forward to the ultimate rest that we have in Christ. It's a day that, where, that points us forward to the time when all evil and sickness and pain and suffering in this world will be no more. That's what the Bible tells us. But for, for this man, who loved, who loved rules and regulations over people, well, it's worse than that, isn't it? Because Jesus says he loves animals more than people. Because you can read a whole list of pharisaical traditions that allowed uh, people to untie their animals on the Sabbath day and to lead it in order to give it water. But to heal a woman who had been a, a, a daughter of Abraham, someone created in the image of God from her infirmity for 18 years, unthinkable and unspeakable, come back another day. You see what religion does? False religion, anyway. You see what what that sort of spirit does? It's a spirit of legalism. It is illogical. It, It saps you dry of any compassion and any love for God's people. And in the end, it actually leads you to break God's law because this man, by observing, by seeking to observe the Sabbath and seeking to teach his people to observe the Sabbath day, was actually breaking the, the, the second uh, and, and most important law of God, which is to love your neighbour as yourself. The second tablet of the law of God. And for that reason, Jesus calls him a hypocrite. You see, he should have been celebrating the Saviour, not rebuking him. Because here was a woman bound by Satan, Jesus says. Bound by Satan. But he had loosed her from his bonds to the glory and praise of, of Almighty God. 
he should have joined in the celebrations with the rest of the people who, when they saw that Jesus had put his adversaries to shame, rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. See, Satan is powerful. And we see his power here in that he bound this woman in her disability for 18 years. But you know, there is something that Satan does which is even worse than that. The Bible is clear that all of us, by nature, are under the power and the influence of the evil one. You might want to turn later to two, Ephesians 2, verses 1 to 2. We've been studying Ephesians in our midweeks, and this is what we read in, in that chapter. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. You see, while we remain unrepentant, we are in spiritual bondage to Satan and enslaved to our sins. But the good news is this. Christ has conquered the kingdom of Satan. And, when he, and he did this by going to the cross and disarming the spiritual powers by dying as a substitute for the sins of his people. Mm. By tasting death on our behalf. So that now everyone who comes to him by faith will be released from their sin and from their bondage to the devil. Therefore repent because, and go on repenting because death is inevitable because God is merciful and because Satan is powerful. Amen.